Hello and welcome to episode 13 of the Social Innovation Think Tank, where we discuss the latest thinking and ideas about social innovation. My name is Paul Tracy, I'm Professor of Innovation and Organisation at the Cambridge Judge Business School and co-director of the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation. We have here as well uh, my colleague and co-host Neil, uh, who is also uh, the co-director of the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation and who leads the Masters in Social Innovation that we run at the school. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, today's guest, who is Professor Wendy Smith. Uh, Wendy is Professor of Management at the Alfred Lerner College of Business and Economics and co-director of the Women's Leadership Initiative at the University of Delaware. She's also a fellow of the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation here at the Judge Business School. Much of Wendy's research is focused on strategic paradoxes and tensions, and in particular, how leaders and organisations respond effectively uh, to contradictory agendas. Now, um, social innovation forms a core part of her work and she spent a lot of time studying how social enterprises can simultaneously attend to both their social missions and their financial goals. And she also has an award-winning paper on this topic that was published in the Administrative Science Quarterly. And we invited Wendy on today to talk specifically about the idea of a paradox mindset, which is a very interesting concept and forms a central part of a book that she's currently writing called Engaging And, How to Adapt and Thrive in a world of competing demands, uh, which is going to come out uh, in spring uh, next year, and which is co-authored uh, co with uh, Marianne Lewis. Uh, so Wendy, uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for talking with us uh, today. Um, let me start off by asking you, what does it mean to have a paradox mindset? So Paul and Neil, thanks for having me. It's so fun to be in this conversation, this ongoing conversation with both of you over time. Um, and to bring these ideas of paradox to the context that uh, is so critical to the work that I do, to the work that you do around social innovation and social enterprise. Um, I, you know, the basic idea of a paradox mindset is to acknowledge that we live in a world where there are a lot of competing demands that we experience. Most of us look at those competing demands things that are in tension with one another. So the work that I initially did was at IBM looking at the tensions between how we navigate today's world and our existing products and what we talk about as exploitation versus tomorrow's world and innovation, what we talk about as exploration and how we navigate to live in the tensions between exploitation and exploration. As you said, I went on to study social entrepreneurship, social enterprise, and how we live within a world or navigate an organization that is trying to both manage for its missions and broader constituency, as well as markets and financial constituency. A paradox approach broadly, or, or said differently, traditionally the way that we tend to deal with those kinds of competing ideas today and tomorrow, social financial, being global and trying to be local at the same time. We tend to think of the tension, the conflict, the, the um, opposition between them, pull them apart and think that we have to make a choice an either or choice. Instead, a paradox approach says, these things live in relationship to one another. They're not just in conflict or contradictory. They're also interdependent. They rely on each other. They, there are synergies. How can we approach this by looking at that both and the ways in which these things come together by living in the ongoing tensions between them and using that to enable us to thrive, to grow, to be creative, to be sustainable. So it's taking that either or mindset that we tend to have in, the con in these contexts and shifting it to a both and mindset, both and approach overall. That links really well to my next question, Wendy, which is um, the extent to which people can be born with the paradox mindset or whether it's something that one needs to learn. Yeah, and it's such a good question. And people are asking us this question as they try and bring in paradoxical thinking into their organization. So, um, for example, I was working with a large organization in Hong Kong. The leader said, if I'm going to effectively move this organization forward, we really are living in these, what they, they call them value pairs. People have called them polarities. And we need to be able to live with this. So it's not just me who needs to be able to understand this. I have to get my senior leaders to really get this to move forward. Or, you know, I know uh, you guys have done some work and talked with um, 
Paul Pullman, when he was leading up Unilever and the Unilever Sustainability Plan, we had some conversations with him as he thought about thinking, you know, the, the sort of sustainability, social responsibility. And his point was, in order to move the organization forward, I need my senior leaders and as many people as possible to embrace, engage my social mission along with my financial mission. So how do I do that? And um, that sort of asked, you know, begs the question, well, do you need to hire people who get it? Or can you get people to get it? And um, I would answer that in two ways. I, the research that we've done, and so we, we, we've done some research to identify what a paradox mindset means, how do you engage that. In that research, what we find is that people will uh, be able to engage and embrace paradox within a particular context if you invite them into that research, I mean, into that question. So for example, uh, our colleague, Ella Marone Spector at INSEAD has done some research with her colleagues on creativity. And she notes that to be creative, you have to be both highly um, innovative, radical innovation novel, but you also have to be really useful and have something that people can actually do something with. And sometimes that usefulness comes directly in conflict with the novelty of something. We see this in the social innovation space too. There's something really great, but you actually can't effectively implement it. So how do you bring both of those together? That feels highly paradoxical to people because you really need both to reinforce each other, but they're driving toward very different processes or goals or outcomes. And what she finds in an experimental setting is that if you just ask people, invite them to think about these things paradoxically, they'll be able to come up with more creative, more sustainable outcomes to a challenge than if, than if not, or than if you, or if you suggest to them that actually these things are oppositional. So on one hand, uh, what that suggests to us is that the context really matters, that the state really matters. It's not just trait, but also the context and the environment. Um, you know, that said, I think that what we also find is that there's people who have more of a proclivity or preference toward this kind of complex, it is complex thinking, and there's people that have more of a born preference toward that. You know, so I think of it in the same way that I think of personality traits that, you know, we think of personality traits that people have more of an automatic preference towards something and yet can learn to behave in ways that aren't necessarily their automatic preference. And if that's the case, then going back to the question from the senior leader, you know, how do I, what do I do to help my organization? Well, then the, the, the answer is, well, on one hand, you help people understand their underlying preferences? Do we tend to be more of a black and white either or thinker? Or do we tend to be more of an, a both and thinker? Um, and then you also create the context where people can more effectively bring out the more complex both and possibilities. And most of the work that we're doing now is, and when I say we, it's myself and my colleague, Marianne Lewis, and you know a broader research team um, is to try and identify what are those contexts that help people navigate or live in that kind of complexity where they're thinking both and. And I'll just say, you know, there's so much to that, but one piece to that is um, an emotional piece. You know, either or think, you know, when we're confronted with both and when there's conflicting ideas, it can be really uncomfortable. There's a lot of uncertainty to it. Um, you know, think about social entrepreneurs who are constantly living in this battle between the social financial pieces. Uh, there can be polarization around it. Uh, we can live with the uncertainty, we, we get uncomfortable with the anxiety that we don't know the answer. And part of the context is helping people, what we would say, be comfortable with the discomfort, live in that emotional space more effectively. Yeah, because as you were talking, it did strike me that it was would be both cognitively and emotionally quite draining, I guess, to be can, always in, in this both hand mindset. So I wonder, is this something that one only applies at particular points of time when one does face a particular problem in a particular context? Is it something that one combines with other types of cognitive strategy? You know, I think so. Um, you know, and again, I think it depends on the person, you know, so for some people, actually thinking both and is energizing. And it opens up new possibilities, and it gets them unstuck. So, you know, and it may be and I don't, I don't, I'm not saying this from a research perspective, I'm just saying this sort of from a 
a hypothetical a hypothesis, right? So I don't I don't have a thesis, I have a hypothesis here, but it may be that there's kind of that S curve, or that you know inverted U curve, in which there's a certain um you know, or let me take a step back. When you're dealing with competing demands, so I'll take it well. When you're dealing with competing demands, there's a lot of frustration in it. And it may be that, and what we find is that people who bring a both and mindset can unlock that frustration. Now, sometimes you just need to make a decision and it may be that applying too much of a both and mindset can be really problematic. And so I think there's there's that, which is a little bit of both anding the both and, and here's what I mean by that. Uh, what we advocate for is that a both and strategy, thinking paradoxically, a paradox mindset helps us introduce new novel ideas. And yet sort of the, and so rather than either or thinking, there's both and thinking, but people will say to us, well, that's kind of either oring the either or versus the both and, right? And so, you know, really what, what we would suggest is that paradox 2.0 is actually learning to live with making either or decisions within and in, within the context of both and, living with both of those simultaneously. Okay, so that sounds super abstract, but you know, I can give you sort of a quick example of what I mean by that. Um, so uh, Paul, you mentioned this paper in ASQ that I wrote with Mariah Besharoff, and the paper is about um, an organization called Digital Divide Data, which is a work, uh, work integration organization that started in 1999 in, in Cambodia and has expanded to Southeast Asia more broadly, Africa, and into the United States. And the key tensions that they feel, so, so underlying, they have a commitment to advancing and helping thousands of people to move out of the cycle of poverty, as they say. So the idea is that if uh, the people that are most disadvantaged in the country can't get good jobs, they will remain in the cycle of poverty. But if they can help them to develop their skills and provide and 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 provide them with effective jobs and then help them move into better jobs, then they can stop that cycle of poverty for themselves and for the next generation. So that's their mission. And they do it by, uh, they are a data integration or a high, what, what do they call themselves? A labor intensive IT organization. So they started out by digitizing all kinds of archival material. People are working on the job, doing on the job training. They are on an ongoing basis navigating their commitment to being operationally sustainable and bringing in revenues and being able to cover their costs. But their competition doesn't have a whole nother agenda, which is that they're bringing in the most disadvantaged people in the country in order to work in the organization and helping them learn over time. And that's costly and demanding. So on an ongoing basis, they're dealing with the kinds of you know, tensions that the people that you teach and the people that you work with who are developing social enterprises are really dealing with, which is, do I buy more computers to and, and hire more people to get more work done? Or do I you know, provide for more training and development for the population? Do I, and this was a big question that they asked up front, do I bring on people who are more skilled graduating from university but have are not quite as um, uh, uh, challenged or have fewer challenges than people who are working in the sweatshops or who were born with a physical disability and couldn't get work? And so those are the kinds of ongoing, you know, on the ground tensions. And sometimes they have to make either or decisions in order to move forward on some of these challenges. And yet those either or decisions are in the context of an overarching agenda to maintain a commitment to doing both the social mission and the financial on an ongoing basis. So while in the moment they might be making some either or decisions at the more global level, they're still holding on to you know, the both and. So for example, they had early on, a, a, they, they are, they, their first offices were in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. And early on they said, look, like Phnom Penh is the one big city in Cambodia. It's the one place where there's opportunity. What we really wanna do is provide opportunity in the most rural areas of Cambodia, these like rice paddies where there's not a lot of uh, economic employment. And, and yet, you know, and so they had what they called their thatched hut dream. Like, let's go out and, and uh, they went and explored and they started relationships with people who were in rural communities. And then they would go out to these rice paddies and realize that like if the, you know, they needed people to have basic electricity and the electricity went down at all times or basic internet. And if the internet went down, they were out of work for eight days. So while they made a decision not to, you know, eventually they called it the thatched hut nightmare. 
And while they eventually didn't go in that direction, it doesn't mean that they gave up their social mission. It means that they made a choice in that moment for that instantiation of the tension. And yet in the sort of more complex both and way, we're still trying to figure out, okay, well then how do I serve people from rural communities? So instead they decided that they were gonna set up a, an office in Batambang, which is the next biggest city, but small and serves all these rural communities and be able to provide for people who lived in the rural communities, but could come into Batambang. Now it wasn't as ideal for them as going out to the rice paddies, but it did allow them to both be able to advance their social mission without going broke essentially. So I'm gonna pause there because I know that was a lot, but I think that sort of thinking through both in the moment, what are the challenges, but also what's the global overarching challenge helps us articulate this idea of a both and mindset. Well, I mean, it's an interesting example because you know when one thinks about paradox mindset, one thinks about individuals and leaders and, and managers, but of course there you were talking about a social enterprise and organization operating in a community. And, and that raises the, the, the question about whether, and of course, the three of us here are organization studies people, and we like to uh, translate individual level concepts to uh, organizations. Yeah. It raises the question about the extent to which uh, a paradox mindset could be applied to an organization or a community in which an organization operates. Yeah, so here's where I would extend it. I think the word mindset gets people tripped up because that feels like it's a very cognitive thing within, and you know, it's what happens inside my brain. And here's where I would extend it to the concept of a paradoxical approach. And certainly what we see people studying paradox is, you know, how do we create the conditions? Uh, and people will study paradox at the individual level. How do I think about my own dilemmas that are in my own life? Or how do I think about leading an organization, but me as the decision maker? There is a whole lot of work about paradox on teams. And then there's a whole lot of work about paradox and navigating paradox at the organizational level, or even the inter-organizational level, as we see increasing numbers of, co of collaboratives, of organizations coming together to solve some of the world's greatest challenges. You know, and, and each of those bring up different types of tensions. But to your point, to your question about paradox mindset at the organizational level, I think I would sort of extend the language to talk about creating a paradoxical approach or a paradoxical culture within your organization, meaning how does how, how do you create within your organization the conditions so that at the organizational and strategic level, the people within are able to hold competing demands, whether those competing demands are social financial or again, you know, are global local or, you know, today and tomorrow. I mean, I'll, I'll just give you one other example. Um, um, my colleague, our colleague, Natalie Slowinski and I have been studying, as, as you both know and have seen, uh, this social enterprise in Newfoundland, uh, the Shorefast, or Shorefast, which owns the Fogo Island Inn. And their main challenge is to think about, well, their local challenge is to think about how to redevelop a community that was dying because their main resource, which is the codfish, was, was uh, diminished. And how do they rebuild this local place in a way that's economically sustainable so that the, this place could survive? There was people leaving the island in droves because the services were diminishing. Um, their more global question is how to create places, how to, how to keep people sort of committed to, to distinct places and really value distinct places and communities. But I'll, I'll just say one of the biggest challenges for them and Zita Cobb, their CEO, uh, is a tension of how do they on the island both honor what's so unique in their tradition and who they've been and what's so valuable there, but at the same time, modernize and change and develop in ways that helps them sort of more, you know, that tradition is great, but that tradition is dying. They can't sustain themselves just by holding on to the way they've always been in the past. How do they modernize in ways that helps them sort of bring them into the 21st century in a way that allows them to um, honor what they've always done. So for Zita Cobb, this is a real ongoing tension between valuing the past and moving to the future, valuing the past and moving to the future. That's sort of core, you know, so when we talk about paradoxes in social entrepreneurship or social enterprise, or even we, we tend to look at this social financial mission market as a main tension, but embedded within them are all these other tensions, you know, this, this, tradition versus modernization, or for Zita, she, you know, she's navigating 
how they remain highly local and value what's unique and distinct about the local space. But in order to do that, she has to bring this community to connect to the rest of the world in a global way. And she's got this great, I'll, I'll just borrow this because I think it's a great metaphor or um, you know, illustration. She talks about the world as a cauliflower in terms of all of these little florets on the cauliflower are so unique and distinct, but they have to be connected to a really strong root of, a, of global systems. And so here, you know, again, is this tension of how do you think about an, as an organization, both what's global and how to connect globally, but also being, you know, unique and local, that's a paradoxical tension right there. And, you know, that kind of mindset that says, okay, how do we switch the question from, do we either focus on the local or the global? Do we either focus on, you know, the old or, you know, old tradition or the new modernization? Do we either focus on social or financial to how do we accommodate both simultaneously is that overall approach that we're talking about? So I think you touched on this already, but I mean, uh, let's, let's, let's try and delve a little deeper. So how do you think the, you know, the relevance of what you've been talking, the paradox, to social innovation as an area of practice? Yeah, you know, Neil, I, I sometimes think, and I'll give you credit and, and for challenging me and inviting me into thinking about the broader history of, of the relationship between mission and markets and organizations, right? So I remember a conversation you and I had a long time ago where you said, look, like if we look at all the cooperatives and all of the development of industry starting there, that's really industry developed in service of a social mission, in service of creating communities and bringing people together and yet, if we think historically, there's been this real divide, if you will, sociologically, and certainly that it is enforced by our legal systems and our you know, regulatory systems, and that's being enforced in our mindsets that, that mission or market are really separate entities. And as, as you, know, you know, and people watching this know, and we've, we've sort of moved beyond that in the last 20 years, bringing this back together. But I'll just tell you that, you know, historically, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, that I remember before I, in my previous sort of several years before coming back to grad school to do a PhD, I spent several years as a management consultant. And I remember it was around the time that um, Ben and Jerry's and the body shop were starting to introduce back into the, our ideas of social, or, you know, of organizations that there could be this idea of socially responsible businesses. And they had started businesses for social responsibility. And I remember, and I was thinking a lot about this and it was right before Enron fell and we had all these massive you know, crises of organizations that were ethically challenged because they were so focused on their financial bottom line and had no sense of a broader sense of stakeholders. Um, and I was sitting down one night with my uh, manager of my, my project manager for the project we were on and we were in some really fancy dinner in midtown Manhattan because that's what you did in the late 1990s as a consultant. And I remember saying at the time, you know, or sort of introducing the idea of businesses for social responsibility. And as, as you, you know, as you may have experienced, but I remember him very clearly articulating the dominant framework of the time, which came out of the Milton Friedman headline of, you know, this social missions are really not the responsibility or not the focus of a for-profit organization. For-profit organizations of both legally and you know, you know, commitments to their stakeholders, et cetera, have to be managed and maintain their profit status. And um, I mean, that was sort of historically a dominant mindset that has shifted pretty significantly as we know going forward. I think that with that, and so to go back to your question, I think that as a world, we have seen that shift over the last 20 years. I think that shift is partially a function of having to rethink whether an organization can be focused only on one kind of goal or really can accommodate competing, you know, multiple goals where those multiple goals feel like at moments they're in competition. They're in competition for resources. They're in competition for the kinds of people that you would hire. They're in competition for uh, the strategic focus of the organization. You know, that's really a paradoxical approach where we said, yes, we can live both and in this kind of work. And I think that if we then take that to the next level, it's to 
honor and acknowledge those types of competing demands. And I'll, I'll just say one more thing, or yeah, I'll just I'll toss out one more thing because you know I think early in the in the early days, um, and certainly when I first met Jeremy Hockenstein, who is the CEO of Digital CEO and founder of Digital Divide Data, and certainly in many of the conversations I've had with both of you and with many of the people who've gone through the uh, Masters of Social Innovation. I think there is um, a point of view from social entrepreneurs that um, that says, look, the world would say that there's this conflict or tension between social and financial, but actually they're highly integrative and synergistic and we can think about them as integrative and synergistic. And that's what Jeremy would say to me as well. I mean, and, and I remember sort of having this conversation with him, but what about this tension? What about that tension? And he would sort of walk, you know, sort of walk back from it and talk about how he solved those tensions. My sense is, is that that uh, approach, which I think is really helpful, is in part a reaction to just how many people have told social entrepreneurs, actually, these things are in conflict and they can't be, they can't be dealt with simultaneously. And yet, when you talk with them and unpack sort of the day-to-day -day, moment to moment, there are these ongoing instantiations, these ongoing moments where you actually have to make decisions between these two, or they really do sort of are challenging about who to hire or where to be located or what software to use or you know or or you know broader questions how to grow where the social mission and financial mission come in conflict and they do they it, just as anything happens and that's sort of the paradoxical approach right there which is to say you know there is both these conflicts and there's these synergies and we have to understand both of them to be effective going forward it could have been you know, business school academics actually caused the problem in the first place. By talking yes. about these tensions it's, that we, when I was a social entrepreneur, faced, always, I always struggled with myself. You know, we, yes, we had tensions, but, you know, we always strove to, to get a, a sort of blended outcome. Yeah. And that was sort of second nature rather than, you know. Um, but anyway, one, one thing, you know, um, what I heard you saying is around this is great for creativity, it's great for thinking around problems and thinking about potential solutions, which we all need, especially with the world as it is at the moment. Um, but at some point, one may have to make a decision, either or. Okay. Where, where does, you know, is there a danger that paradoxical thinking can become a sort of, um, a sort of a compromised way of thinking rather than, you know, where's the, where's the politics in this? Where's the, you know, yeah. you're not needed yeah. attention. Yeah, yeah. Well, and Neil, I think that's exactly, you know, so I think that is exactly the point. And actually your first point and your second point sort of blend beautifully because your first point is actually, you know, people impose too much tensions, we do blending. And your second point was actually trying to do too much integrating and we lose the tensions or you have to have the politics and the conflicts and the tensions. And I think, you know, so that's a beautiful setup for what I think of as why, as, as what paradox and a paradox mindset is because um, it's not over. So I would, I think a paradox mindset is seeing the tensions, understanding them, unpacking them, which we talk about as separating or uh, you know differentiating or whatever term to understand what's distinct about these things and where are they oppositional and seeing the points of integration synergy of where these things reinforce and enable one another. And so you know we like to say thinking paradoxic thinking you know thinking about paradox is paradoxical that in order to engage, you know, if it's social financial or global local, like in order to be able to manage going forward, you have to understand where, where's the politics, where's the conflicts, where's the tensions, where's the opposition, and you then have to get your, and, and if you just did that, then you're like in this ongoing world of Milton Friedman, they have to be totally separate organizations because there's too much conflict and tension at all times. Why would, you know, and that's where part of that theory came from, like these things are hard to come together Let's just separate them into different organizations and be done with it, and assume that like we're we're easing up on the on the challenge of bringing them together. So you but so if you do too much of that pulling apart, it's problematic. But I would say that actually, if you do too much of the blending, which is your second part, like if you if you're always trying to find the ideal integration, then 
you actually lose sight of what's so nuanced, distinct, and valuable about each side. You've got to sort of battle out each side and understand what's different. That blended part actually mutes or, or without, without the differentiation, it actually mutes the potential for an even more effective or, you know, and I'll give you an example. So again, when it came to research, uh, my colleague, Josh Keller, who's now in Sydney, but was in Singapore, has really interesting research on how, and, and this looks at how we tend to think about these things east-west. And um, so he looks at um, the fact that in the west, in western culture, we tend to do a lot of the differentiating without a lot of the blending synergy integration. But in the east, there's this sort of emphasis on integration. And yet what he finds is that people don't do enough of the differentiating, enough trying to figure out what does my social mission need? What are its goals? What are its objectives? What are its specifics? What does my financial bottom line mean? What are the goals? What are the objectives? What are the specifics? And then, you know, I'm pulling them apart before you bring them together. And the danger in doing that is that the dominant pole will take over in terms of power because the other pole doesn't have voice or or conversation. And we see that, you know, in, in, in big companies, what we see or in established enterprises without a, a strong social mission, what we see is that the financial pull takes over because that's more short term and quantifiable and demanded. But we've seen this as a trend in social enterprises is that particularly social enterprises with a really strong mission, where the mission will sometimes take over. And, you know, Paul, you've written about this in some of the work that you've done. You know, the mission will take over and kill any, you know, the people won't have a, a decent financial plan to be able to sustain the organization over time because the, the overemphasis on the enthusiasm and, you know, on the mission of the founder, the founder's mission will take over and diminish and kill the, the, the financial uh, value. And so, you know, I think that's exactly the point is that you've got to be able to identify what is distinct about each and then bring them together in a unified way. I've got a really tricky question now. Yeah. Um, I expect there, nothing less, Neil. Are there any potential dangers or risks for social innovators who adapt such a mindset? That's the first part of the question. Yeah. And the second, do you know any instances where it has hindered social innovation yeah. or positive social change? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, I want to answer your previous question first, in, uh, but, and, I'm, and then I'm going to definitely answer this. I want to add, just add one other piece to your previous question, and this um, goes back to very a very tactical piece, right? So, you know, the question is, well, what does it mean to adopt a paradox mindset in an organization? And don't you sometimes have to make either or choices? And I, I want to speak to that because I think sometimes, and, and maybe this does answer your question about, you know, downsides or dark sides or um, potential, you know, roadblocks. One of the roadblocks of paradoxical thinking is that you live in that, and, and people worry about this a lot, is that you live in a wavering where you just don't go forward, that you just are like, you know, waffling. And paradox mindset isn't about waffling or not making decisions. That's not, you know, but that, has, that is a danger. Um, instead, what I would, and what I would suggest is that, and, and by the way, and, and so what I would suggest is that what paradox mindsets are is starting by changing the question when you're confronted with competing demands to which one do I choose to how do I accommodate both? And when we talk about how you accommodate both, we talk about two different strategies. One is what people tend to think, which is that the ideal way to accommodate, you know, your, your mission and your market, or, you know, for Jeremy to accommodate both stopping the cycle of poverty and being a finance, is that you're gonna find this ideal, integrative, blended solution at all times. What we would talk about as a creative integration. So the um, metaphor we use for this is a mule, right? Like the biological hybrid horse and donkey comes together, you got a new thing. And people tend to think that that's sort of the outcome of all paradoxical thinking. And when I, I think I started off by saying when I, um, the, the first study that I ever did was on IBM while they were managing their innovation and the existing products, Explore, Exploit. And when I went in there, the, the first thing I noticed is that most of their decisions actually weren't like in the moment. So on an ongoing basis, they were trying to hold 
their existing world, which at the time was the client server technology, and the new world, which at the time was all this web-based, cloud-based technology. And they weren't making decisions that were always finding this ideal integration between these two. Like it wasn't like every decision about how do we allocate our sales team or how do we allocate our, our engineers at the moment or how do we think about the relationship with these you know, clients or customers or whatever. What they were constantly making either or decisions. And so what I, so we talk about that as, you know, being consistently inconsistent or the metaphor we use for that is living on a tightrope or walking a tightrope or, you know, for my friends in Cambridge where there's double as many bicycles as there's people, you know, riding a bicycle. And the idea here is that you have to be going forward. You're looking at the, the final point and going forward, but you're constantly shifting in this kind of nuanced way between alternatives. You're making a decision at one point to, you know, advance your social mission, another point to advance your financial mission. But the important point here, and, and so it feels like either or decisions in the moment, but the important point here is that you're not overextending your social mission so that you're, you're broke and you're not overextending your financial mission so that you're making these unethical decisions like Enron or, you know, whatever other company you want to put in there. You are, you know, and, and basically falling off the, the tightrope that in order to keep going forward, you're constantly making these micro decisions that shift between the two so that at an overarching level, you're accommodating both. And so like for a bike rider, we almost do this naturally. Like it's almost like second nature to us to do it. But when you've gone too far in either direction, you sort of lose sight of that. And so, so for us, paradoxical, you know, living paradoxically is both those moments of the mule where you can really find an ideal blend, but also those moments of those like, you know, nuanced shift, those oscillations, those, those consistent inconsistencies of the tightrope. And it, it's, and, but to move forward by making those either or choices in the moment that attend to that sort of more broad global both and. Okay, so that I think is sort of a, a basis to then saying, okay, to your point, what's the dangers? Well, the danger is that, you know, of paradoxical thinking is that you think that paradoxical thinking is always the, you know, this ideal integration. And if you don't find it, you know, or you're always looking for it and actually you won't always find it and therefore you sort of give up. Or the danger is that you don't make those either or decisions along the way and you get stuck, you know, or the danger, and we have some colleagues, you know, for the academic audience out there, we have some colleagues that wrote a great paper, um, Marco Berti and A. Simpson, that, that talked about the ways in which paradoxical thinking, you know, the dark side of paradoxical thinking. And they would say that a, a danger is that you think that there's always possibilities for living in these both ands, but that the broader context, and that you, you lose sight of the broader context and power dynamics in the broader context that might prevent you from doing so. Because, you know, as you guys know, being able to effectively engage a social entrepreneurship or any of these things is informed by the broader political context around you. And you have to, you know, sort of think about that as well. And you miss those cues and those politics at the more macro level become problematic. Not the politics micro. I think that there's ways in which you have to learn to live. And I'll just, this is the last thing I'll say. You have to learn to live with and know how to navigate 10, you know, competing ideas within your organizations or within your groups. That's, I think, a skill you need to learn to, to live with paradox is actually how to listen to other people, respect, engage opposing opinions. Um, I think that's critical. And in fact, to go back to Paul Pullman, he once said to us, you know, there are so many tensions that if people are burying them and not surfacing them, I ask them for it. I make them surface those competing demands because that's where we're gonna to get to a more creative possibility going forward. So, so I think you have to engage those even though they're hard to do. Um, but you know, there's the broader political spectrum in which these power dynamics play out as well. I don't know if that answered your question. I think so. I think so. Um, I mean, one thing that strikes me is it get maybe it gets harder as you go up. So an individual can you know think about, develop, and 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 you know sort of uh, culture this sort of mindset. An organization, small one in particular, may be able to manage it. But as you get levels of complexity, especially between organizations, yeah. then you get into really tricky ground. 
Absolutely. In fact, you know, the, the project that I'm working on now with Natalie Slowinski and another colleague, Connie Vanderbilt, is looking at this like amazingly complex um, uh, consortium, interorganizational relationship uh, in Canada at the Canadian Oil Sands in Alberta called COSIA, the Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance. And it's incredibly complex. So the basic idea here is that they were getting beaten up for very good reasons for all of the environmental uh, abominations <laughs> happening out of the dirty oil of the oil sands. And they had a leader in the industry who basically said, look guys, if we're, and, and this is a highly competitive industry. This is, you know, small margins and, you know, an industry where there was basically a gold rush for who can get the, you know, the oil as quickly as possible. And they had a leader who in 2005, when they were getting, you know, people were um, rejecting the Keystone uh, XL pipeline, there were ducks uh, landing on all of their tailing ponds where the oil is taken out of, the bitumen is taken out of, and that were dying like thousands of them. I mean, it was just like an environment and, and um, they, it's a huge water and water uh, consuming organization, deforestation, you know, just environmental, huge environmental impacts. And he basically said, look, guys, like, you know, the world is still going to need oil, but if we're going to survive as an industry, even though we're competitive, we've got to figure out how the 12 or 14 major organizations out here in Alberta work together toward environmental performance and environmental improvement, both because we have to do it, but also because the whole industry is going to be killed if we don't do it. And, you know, this is a tremendously competitive industry where people didn't talk to each other. To be able to effectively bring them together into that conversation was several years worth of really challenging thinking and a real commitment and dedication on the part of their senior leader. And there, or not, he wasn't the senior leader, the sort of founder of this organization. He was the vice president of sustainability for one of the organizations called Suncor. He really did have to advance a paradox mindset of why they had to attend to this environmental issue at the same time. In order to enable the industry to grow, they talked about how if they did not adopt a more environmental mindset, they would not have a social license to operate, meaning people would you know, abandon them, which they were. There was huge like Greenpeace and every environmental organization was in there challenging them. But they also talked about how in order for this consortium to succeed, they had to understand the underlying competitive financial dynamics, economic dynamics between the organizations and build that into the relationship. This like, they, it was a legal commitment from all of these companies. They had to be dealing with both of those. Otherwise there would be no consortium. Now that was not easy. And people were staying up night after night, but you know, I was going to say, but in a cavalier way, I don't mean to be cavalier. Like we know that effective leadership on really successful and novel ideas that really matter is not easy. Like we just know that. And this is one of the ways that it's not easy. And yet there's some, um, there's some frameworks and patterns to help people, you know, and at least some empathy in that, like, it's not easy for lots and lots of leaders. And yet that's what I think leadership is, is living in these kinds of competing demands and knowing how to navigate them. Thank you, Paul. Wendy, thank you very much indeed for talking with, with us today to telling us about paradox, the relevance of paradox for uh, social innovation at across levels um, in organizations, between organizations. Uh, it's been really interesting speaking with you and we're very much looking forward to reading your book with Marianne. It's going to be coming out uh, next year. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you both. It's always such a pleasure and so much fun to be in conversation with both of you. So thank you for the work that you are both doing. <laughs>